Well, thank you for the introduction, Jerry. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that today's talk is a joint work with Ming Kong Zhang. And, um, and throughout this talk, um, I will restrict myself to the prime two. And my group G is gonna be a finite two group. This is only an assumption so that I can avoid odd primary technicalities and present the gist of the work. This does not mean that there are no odd primary analogs. In fact, there are, and they are equally good. So let's begin. Um, in 1947, my great, great, great mathematical grandfather, Norman Steenrod, uh, defined operations on the mod two cohomology theory of spaces. Um, which are called the Steenrod squaring operations. The ith squaring operation is characterized, characterized by three rules. Um, first, it has to be natural in the variable x, which is your input as space. Uh, two, the um, ith squaring operation uh, squares elements in degree i and acts trivially in degree less than i. And uh, the third and perhaps a very important one is, is the fact that the Steenrod squaring operations has to commute with the suspension isomorphism, which is one of the axioms of cohomology theory. So, um, so in general for cohomology theory, you have this isomorphism and the Steenrod squaring operations has to commute with this, with this isomorphism. So um, in 1952, Jose Adem proved a conjecture of Wu, which describes the relation between uh, uh, squaring operation, uh, operations under compositions. And these, uh, these relations are called uh, Adam relations. And together, um, this leads to the construction of an algebra uh, by considering the free algebra generated by this symbol square i and modding out by the Adam relations. And this is called the Steenrod algebra. This is not a commutative algebra. And uh, this algebra is definitely one of the most important computational gadgets in homotopy theory, if not the most important. So in modern algebraic topology, we have a very clean way of viewing Steenrod algebra. Firstly, we like to view the mod two cohomology theory through the lenses of representing objects, um, which is denoted by HF2 and, um, and is called the uh, mod two allen bermek lens spectrum. Shoot, mod two. Ellenberg McLean spectrum. What this means is that uh, the nth cohomology of any space X is in one to one correspondence between uh, homotopy class of maps from X into suspension N of HF2, which is often written as minus N in the, as, a, as a subscript. So then the Steenrod uh, algebra is nothing but homotopy class of self maps of Allen bermek maclean spectrum. And from this formulation, it is very, to, very easy to see the action of Steenrod algebra on cohomology of any space. It is simply given by composition. Now, um, I do not think I need to highlight the importance of Steenrod algebra to today's audience, but Still, I will mention a couple. Uh, firstly, uh, it led to the uh, Stiefel Whitney classes, which are characteristic classes. Uh, one defines the uh, ith uh, Stiefel Whitney class of a bundle by first applying the squaring operation to, um, to uh, the uh, thumb class. 
and then um, then we pull back uh, the the corresponding class via uh, a chosen thumb isomorphism. And um, and um, Stifel Whitney class led to many fascinating applications to geometry. It can be used to study immersions of manifolds in Euclidean spaces. It also led to the calculation of unoriented cobordism ring and complex cobordism ring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, um, also these Steenrod operations uh, or Steenrod algebra um, is the key component um, of what is called the Adam spectral sequence, which is a spectral sequence like this, calculating uh, the homotopy groups, um, uh, you know, uh, which is a perhaps, you know, the Adam spectral sequence is the most powerful tool to uh, in tackling perhaps the most difficult problem in stable homotopy theory, which is calculating the stable homotopy groups of spheres. Um, and uh, I can keep going, but instead I will simply say that homotopy theory without Steenrod operations is like a world without electricity. Uh, because Steenrod algebra underlies almost all important calculations in stable homotopy theory. So today's goal is to provide electricity to equivariant stable homotopy theory. So, um, so in G equivariant, so I have fixed my G, which is a two group now. In G equivariant stable homotopy theory, the analog of the ordinary cohomology with F2 coefficient is uh, G equivariant ordinary cohomology with coefficients uh, in the constant Mackey functor. So this is a constant Mackey functor denoted by F2 with an underline. Um, uh, F2 underline is, is, a, is the constant Mackey functor at F2. Uh, very roughly speaking, what this means is that for a G space X, this cohomology theory calculates um, uh, the ordinary F2 cohomology of the fixed point space with respect to all subgroups of G. And uh, the grading over here are no longer integers. These are graded by ROG, which is the representation ring of G, which is the group completion of representations under direct sum, uh, G representations or real G representations under direct sum. And just like uh, ordinary cohomology theory, the G equivariant ordinary cohomology theory with coefficients in constant Mackey functor F2 is represented by a G equivariant spectrum, which is, uh, uh, which is G equivariant allen bermeklin spectrum with coefficients in F2. And uh, what this means is that the G equivariant cohomology of a G equivariant space X with coefficients in F2 underlined is nothing but homotopy class of equivariant maps from X into HF2 underlined. And then one can abstractly define the equivariant Steenrod algebra as G as, as homotopy class of G equivariant self maps of HF2 underline. But this does not throw any light on um, what the structure of this algebra is. So before I go further, I just want to point out a couple things. One is that the G equivariant Steenrod algebra is, uh, is an algebra over the homotopy groups of the allenberg maclean spectrum. Uh, which I would denote by MG throughout this talk. So um, before I state my results, I want to say what is known. First of all, when G is trivial, you know, this can be, this is basically a reinterpretation uh, or this is basically the work of Steenrod and Adam. Um, the, when G is equal to C2, so the 21st century has seen uh, the first, uh, uh, you know, equivariant Steenrod algebra for the first non-trivial group, which is C2. In this case, the coefficient ring, which is the homotopy group of Allenberg-McLean spectrum, turns out to be 
uh, this this ring. Uh, it consists of two parts. First part is um, first part is a polynomial on a sigma and u sigma with certain grading, and the uh, second part consists of a uh, of a generator theta which is infinitely divisible by both a sigma and u sigma. Uh, and this is often called the negative cone. And it uh, turns out that the mod two standard algebra is free uh, over this coefficient ring generated by, uh, generated by this squaring operation square i for each integer greater than zero modded out by Adam relations, which are different from the uh, classical Adam relations um, and um, the credit goes to Hu and Krish, uh, who who actually described the dual standard algebra, um, and um, and also Wojewski, who uh, described the actually the standard algebra for the Motivic analog, which is very closely related to the C two equivariant standard algebra. So now. I want to point out the difficulty here. Forget about knowing standard algebra. Uh, even the coefficient ring, uh, which is which is only known for um, trivial group, which we know is F two, C two. This is a computation due to Hu and Chris, and and C four, uh, which is a computation due to Ming Kong, and uh, and a student of Peter May. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick I'm, I'm going to not pronounce his last name correctly, so I'm going to say Nick Chi. Um, so today's goal, so here is today's goal. So what I'm going to do today, what is new? So I'm going to construct G equivariant squaring operations. And the G equivariant squaring operation is going to be a cohomology operation from um, from the G equivariant uh, ordinary cohomology with coefficients in constant Mackey functor F2 uh, to itself uh, with certain shift. So this is going to be called this, uh, this norm of alpha is going to be uh, the degree of alpha where alpha is going to be what I like to call Eulerian sequence. Now, as the name suggests, it has something to do with Euler class and Euler class has something to do with bundles. So I'm going to detour. So my first job is going to be, going to explain what Eulerian sequence mean. So I'm going to construct a G equivariant analog of the tautological uh, bundle. So I'm going to construct G equivariant tautological bundle. So what is that? First, I recall the, uh, uh, it is a generalization of the tautological line bundle over RP infinity. So one way to express RP infinity is uh, B sigma two, which can also be written as a co-limit of these things, which are actually RPN. So what this is, this is, I, I, I endow the nth sphere with with the antipodal map that is an action of sigma two, and then I quotient it out. So uh, maybe a better way of writing this uh, would be, you know, to indicate the action of sigma two, I'm going to write this as the units in the n-fold direct sum of a representation of sigma two, which is the sign re representation. So this, by looking at the units in this n-fold direct sum, uh, I, I get the antipodal points um, on the on the nth n minus one nth sphere, or maybe this is n plus one in this case. Doesn't matter. I'm taking co-limit over n, um, and the tautological line bundle can be written as a balanced product of of um, of uh, of the sphere with the antipodal action, uh, and then crossing over with the with the sign representation, which is the which is a representation of sigma two. Um, so now I'm going to generalize this bundle in the G equivariant settings for all group G, all two groups G. 
So, so I'm by rho, I'm going to denote the regular representation of G and tau is going to be the sine representation of sigma two. So I'm going to construct a G equivariant bundle, uh, which I'm going to denote by gamma subscript G, whose underlying space is going to be written as, as this co-limit. So what this is, I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider the tensor product of rho uh, uh, with tau. That is, this is a, this is a, um, this thing is a G cross sigma two representation. And I'm going to take the n-fold direct sum of it. And uh, I'm going to take the units in there. And then I'm going to attach uh, the antipodal ma map by using the sigma two action. So uh, the underlying space of this, this uh, BG sigma two um, is, um, is RP infinity. Uh, but then its fixed points with respect to various subgroups of G are uh, complicated, uh, but can be described. Now, over this G equivariant analog of RP infinity, I'm going to construct a total space, which I'm going to, which I'm denoting by E G sigma, by taking the exact same co-limit instead of using the zero vector space, I'm going to use the uh, the G cross sigma two representation, which is nothing but rho tensor tau, the regular representation of G tensor the sine representation. So if you forget, if you forget the G action over here, then um, then um, forget G action completely. So that is you restrict to the tri trivial group, then you are going to get the uh, the uh, order of G for direct sum of the tautological line bundle over RP infinity. And, and this has been equipped with some action of G. Okay. So now the claim is that this, this bundle uh, gamma G is, is orientable with respect to uh, the allen maclean spectrum or the ordinary cohomology with coefficients in F2 cross. That is, I want to say that the allen maclean spectrum with F2 coefficients, F2 underlying coefficient does not distinguish between gamma G and uh, a corresponding trivial bundle, which I'm going to construct as follows. So I'm going to take this, uh, and I'm going to remove the sine representation over here by the trivial representation. And this is this I'm going to call epsilon G. So here I'm on the total space, uh, the, the, uh, the over. So this is like, uh, this is like a row dimensional trivial bundle over whatever this base space, which is BG Sigma two. And the point is, that um, point is that HF2 underline is not going to distinguish between uh, gamma, uh, gamma G and epsilon G, which is a trivial bundle. So why so? Well, classically, you know, every bundle is HF2 orientable. That's because, um, that's because if I take the field of order two and look at the unit, it is the uh, trivial, it is the trivial group. And in this case, the same thing holds, except for Mackie functor, if I take the F2 uh, uh, with a constant Mackie functor, which is also has a multiplicative structure. And if I look at the unit, then it is the trivial Mackie functor. So everything is going to be orientable. So in particular, uh, this this particular HF two is not going to distinguish between this. So what what does it give us? It gives us so whenever there is an orientation, there is a corresponding. An orientation is a choice of Thom isomorphism by definition. So 
So I'm going to get a thumb isomorphism, which is going to say that if I look at the thumb space of gamma G and smash it with HF2, this is going to be the same as the thumb space of epsilon G smashed with HF2. But the thumb space of epsilon G is going to be nothing but uh, uh, sigma rho. So you, you can now, in equivalent world, you can suspend in the, uh, with, in the direction of representations. So you take sigma rho of, the, of your base space, which is BG sigma two smashed with HF2. And a thumb isomorphism, what it gives us is a, is a thumb class. And, um, and the thumb class is then going to be a class in the, in the Roeth G equivalent ordinary cohomology of the thumbs space of gamma G with coefficients in F2 underline. And what thumb class gives us is an Euler class. So how do we get the Euler class? Well, there is always a map from your base space with a base point to the thumb space of your bundle. And this map is called the, the zero section. And you can pull back the Tom class along this zero section to get this Euler class. So, so now we have the Euler class, and now I'm going to describe what an Eulerian sequence is. So what is an Eulerian sequence? Well, a sequence of elements in the homology, G equivalent homology of BG sigma two, which is a, a bunch of elements. I'm denoting this sequence by alpha, uh, which consists of A0, A1, A2, is called Eulerian if it satisfies two properties. Number one, that if I look at AI plus one, the I plus one -th element, and cap with the, with the Euler class, so Euler class in the, is in the cohomology, so you can cap an element in the homology with, with a class in the cohomology, then it has to become, then it has to be AI. So there is a, there is a relation between AI and AI plus one. And, and then there is an initial condition, which is if you, if you look at the first element and, and you cap it with the Euler class, it has to be equal to zero. So this is my definition of Eulerian class. And the goal is to construct standard operations, equivariant standard operations, corresponding to each Eulerian class. Now I want to make some remark so that we don't get confused later on. First of all, because of this, uh, because of this relation, the first relation that you know, AI plus one cap with the Euler class has to be AI, it implies that the degree of AI has to be equal to uh, rho plus the degree of AI minus one. And if you continue along those lines, you're going to get this is equal to um, uh, I rho plus degree of A0, the initial thing. And this, this shift degree for this, this norm of alpha is going to be the negative of, negative of, the, uh, of the degree of the first element. And this is going to be same for AI rho minus the degree of AI for all I. So this is a constant, and this is going to be my shift degree. So, I also want to point out that if once you get an Eulerian class or Eulerian sequence, then you can shift them. So you can consider the nth shift where you stick in zeros n many times, and then you also get an uh, then you also get an Eulerian sequence because the same relationship are going to hold because uh, because you know because zero cap with the Euler class is still going to be zero. So. So, okay, so before I describe how to construct all of these things, I want to give you a feel, you know, how it connects to the known example. So I'm going to go back to the classical case, which is G equal to one. So I have to look at the homology of my, of B sigma two in this case, or BG sigma two, where G is identity. And this homology is very well known. This homology is nothing but it is, it is generated uh, as an F2 vector space by infinitely many elements denoted by B0, B1, B2, where Bi is in degree I. 
and bi's are dual to uh, uh to the class t to the i which is um which is in the cohomology of uh, b sigma 2 plus and which is also well known to be this polynomial algebra on 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 the generator t so in this case the euler class which is a class in the cohomology of b sigma 2 of the tautological line bundle in this case is is the is the element t you can you can choose that to be your euler class and then you can see that um, if you take bi plus one and cap with the Euler class, then you're going to get bi. So this is just a fact, just, just the fact that, just the definition of what bi's are, it follows. So, um, so then what does this, so now we have an Eulerian sequence, which is just this list b0, b1, B2, which is the set of generators over here, they form an Eulerian sequence. And turns out that this uh, Eulerian sequence corresponds to a squaring operation, but it is going to be the zeroth squaring operation, which is it's going to be trivial in, in this case. And as we see the construction, you will know why. But if you take the nth shifts of this, of this uh, Eulerian sequence, then you're going to get square n. So in this way, using Eulerian sequence, you can describe all squaring operations in the ordinary Steenrod algebra. Okay, let's go to another example. The other known example, which is, uh, which is G equal to the C2, the first non-trivial group. In this case, the cohomology of B C two sigma two has been computed. And I believe this computation is due to, again, um, who Krish and Wojewski, Wojewski again constructs an R motivic analog of this, but can be, can, you know, it follows. Um, uh, so what this is, this is, uh, this is a free. Uh, uh, this is free on the um, on the coefficient ring, which is M C two, um, adjoined with two generators y and x, which satisfies this relation y square equal to a sigma u and u sigma x, where a sigma um, a sigma and u sigma are elements in the coefficient ring. Uh, which uh, which were the polynomial generators that I described previously, and the degree of of y uh, in the in, in the ROC two grading is is sigma the sign representation of C two, and degree of x is rho. Now, which means that if I just look at it as a um, as a as a MC two module. Then it is generated by well you have you have expressed y square in terms of y and x so you have only generators y x y x x squared y x squared and so on and so forth so and now because this is a this is free uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's dual so the homology of b c to sigma two can be computed by just taking the linear dual and um, and you can, and these are generated by elements such as B sigma, B rho, B sigma plus rho, B two rho, B sigma plus two sigma, two rho plus sigma, and so on and so forth, uh, where there is a correspondence that um, B sigma is dual to Y, B rho is dual to X, B rho plus sigma is dual to y x and so on. So these are all dual to each other. So, so then you get the then you get two families of Eulerian sequence. One um, um, so I should also mention that in this case the Euler class uh, Euler class of 
gamma C2 is X. Okay, so from just by this definition, you get two sequence of Eulerian sequence. One is this family beta n, which is you start by shifting uh, by n, and then you start with one, but then you have b rho, b2 rho, and, and so on and so forth. And then there is another, um, uh, another family, which is gamma n, which starts off with n zeros, and then you have b sigma, b rho plus sigma, b2 rho plus sigma, and so on and so forth. Now, this beta family is going to give you um, the even dimensional C2 equivariant squaring operations. And this gamma family is going to give you the odd dimensional uh, uh, C2 equivariant squaring operations. Okay, so now that I have described uh, uh, Eulerian sequence, let's get into the philosophy of how to construct it. So the key idea is the is the is is the is the following fact that you know the classical Steenrod operation is a consequence of actually two geometric facts. One is that the allenberg meklen spectrum is an E infinity ring spectrum, which means that you are you have maps theta n, which are maps from d n, which is called the nth extended power of HF2 to HF2, well, dn, what is dn? dn of any spectrum E is going to be E sigma n plus smash over sigma n with um, E to the nth smash power, where the sigma n, sigma n acts on, uh, sigma n acts on uh, by permutation on this, on the, on the right-hand side, and this, E sigma n is the uh, is the universal or the or the total space of the classifying space of uh, of sigma n uh, principal bundles. And E infinity structure means that there are maps like this, and they satisfy certain compatibility criteria between them, which I'm not going to describe. And the second geometric fact that, you can, that is needed in the construction of Steenrod operation is the fact that the tautological line bundle, which is gamma one over RP infinity is HF2 orientable. What it gives you is a thumb class for the n-fold direction, for each n, you can take the n-fold direction of gamma one, and that is an n-dimensional bundle. So you are, because it is, uh, HF2 orientable, you're going to have a Tom class, which is which I'm going to denote by UN, which is a map from the Tom space of uh, n fold direct sum of gamma one to the suspension n of the Allen Bermeklen spectrum. So you have all of these ends. And they also satisfy certain criteria because, you know, because uh, n times gamma one plus gamma one is n plus one times gamma one. So you can use that to get some compatibility. Okay, so now I'm going to show how to construct Steenrod algebra using these two because uh, whoever is familiar with the equivariant world, you can see that there are there are corresponding uh, analogous statements of these both of these in the equivariant world. So first of all, these two conditions leads to what is called power operations. So what is it? Well, given a class U in the nth cohomology of a space X, now I have sticked in some disjoint base point because I want to work with spaces which does not have a base point. Um, and my cohomology is from now is going to be reduced uh, just, just to avoid technicality. Um, okay, anyway, so if I take a class U in the nth cohomology of X with coefficients in F2, then you can think of it as a map from X to the nth suspension of the allen meklen spectrum. And the power operation is a construction which constructs from you uh, an element P of you in the 2nth two um, two cohomology of the second extended power of X. So here you can think of uh, uh, D2 of uh, X plus as uh, E sigma two cross over sigma two X cross two with the disjoint base point, I think. Okay, base point always confuses me. So if I'm making a mistake, please ignore. 
And how is this constructed? Well, construction is fairly simple. So I'm going to Okay, so here is what you do. You have this class, you start with this class U, and then you apply D2 is a functor, so you apply D2 to U. And so you land in the D2 of the nth suspension of H. So H for me is HF2, it's an abbreviation. And uh, where D2 works, you know, you can think of sigma N as, as smashing with SN. So you have a map from D2 of sigma NH to D2 of Sn smash d2 of h. Now, a key fact is that d2 uh, d2 of Sn, which is e sigma two plus smash over Sn. Uh, okay. Sn cross Sn um, over sigma two, where sigma two acts by flipping these two factors is nothing but the suspension n of the Tom space of the n-fold direct sum of gamma one. So this is, this is a key fact. Um, uh, okay. Um, this is a key fact that I use here. So now I can use the n-fold suspension of the, of the Tom class of n gamma one along with the uh, with the with the map that I get from the E infinity structure of the Allen Bermac lens spectrum to land in suspension 2n of H smash H. And then I use the multiplication on H to give us a map from uh, D, the second extended power of X to the 2n at suspension of H, which is nothing but this this class in the in, in degree 2n. Okay. So now how power operation leads to squaring operations? Well, here the key fact is, is the fact that when you have a space, the diagonal map is sigma two equivariant, where sigma two acts trivially on the, on the domain X, but acts by the flip action. So what it gives you uh, is that, um, is, a, is a map from B sigma two cross X to D two of X. So this is E sigma two, uh, cross x cross over sigma two. And this is, you can also write this as E sigma two cross over sigma two with x, but sigma two acts trivially. So you can, you can take the quotient of E sigma two with sigma two and that gives you B sigma two. And so you can use Delta to pull back your power construction on you. And you can you can express this um, express this as a as a sum of elements using this formula, and this formula determines this ith squaring operation. One of the things I want to point out is that this this thing, you know, here I'm here I'm using uh, Kunet isomorphism. The, the, the fact that, you know, cohomology of B sigma two cross X is going to be isomorphic to cohomology of B sigma two uh, tensor with uh, cohomology of X. Perhaps I should put some, uh, maybe if I'm using base points, then I should, I should add this notation. Okay. Okay, so now, now in the equivariant world, uh, the the G equivariant steam rod operations are going to be the uh, the consequences of the fact that HF two underline is an infinity G ring spectrum. What it means is that it's a genuine G equivariant ring spectrum. What it gives us is is a map theta n just like the classical class from the G equivariant extended power operation of HF two to HF two, where the nth G equivariant power operation is, is nothing but this construction where you replace E sigma n by the G equivariant analog, which is denoted by E subscript G sigma n. And uh, these are uh, determined by some universal property. These are very well known. 
And the second fact, which I already dis discussed, is the fact that this bundle that I constructed, gamma G, is HF, HF2 underline orientable. So then the second fact is going to give you a Tom class from uh, the Tom space of N gamma G to sigma N rho of HF2. And just by following the diagram very similar to the classical case, you're going to have a power operation construction. So here, you know, here is the diagram. So if you start with the class U in um, HN row of X, then you can, you can make the exact same uh, analogy and except there is one fact that is needed that is, you know, the, uh, the second extended pow power of n rho is nothing but suspension n rho of the Tom space of n gamma g. And so this composite is then going to be your P of u. Okay, so this is exactly the same. And now we are going to make use of the diagonal map. So for a G space X, uh, so X is equipped with a uh, uh, with an action of G, but we are going to also give it an action of sigma two, which is the trivial action, and regard X as a G cross sigma two space, and I'm going to consider its a Cartesian product with itself, and also consider it as a G cross sigma two action, except sigma two acts by the flip action here. And you can see that the diagonal map is going to be a G equivariant map. And so you're going to get a map from BG sigma two plus smash over X plus to the second extended equivariant extended uh, power of X. Now, now, so given a new, you have this power operation uh, in, in N row, you have a power operation on two N row, uh, a cohomology of, uh, of X. And so you can pull back along this, this map delta to get uh, a map, uh, get an element in the two N row at G equivariant homology of BG sigma two cross X. Now, the problem here is, that we do not have any Kuneta isomorphism. So what do we do? So here is my definition. So this is where the Eulerian sequence comes into play. So what you do is you consider an Eulerian sequence and given a class U in dimension N rho, what you do, you define the alpha at squaring operation as U with the slant product, which is a pairing of this form from the cohomology of A cross B with the homology of A to the cohomology of B to produce an element uh, by, you know, so you define if, if, the, if U is in degree N rho, uh, you define square alpha of U as U slant with the nth entry of this Eulerian sequence. And this is going to be a stable operation and that is guaranteed by the condition that the sequence is Eulerian. Okay, and then there is an abstract question that one may try to uh, answer without even solving anything is that Eulerian sequence generates all Steenrod operations. In fact, gives you, uh, to what extent this is true, I don't know. I'm also running out of time. Um, so I'm going to tell you a couple more things that, you know, what we can do in future. So one is to understand total squaring operation. I wish I had time to describe it for C2, which is very interesting. And Adam relations, how to get Adam relations between the Eulerian sequence. For this, you need the total squaring operations. You also need total squaring operations to define the corresponding stiffel whitney classes G equivariantly. And I, I would strongly encourage people to study, if anyone who is interested in, in calculating this homology group or cohomology group of this equivariant projective space, we should think in terms of Eulerian sequence or families of Eulerian sequence instead of directly trying to calculate it. So we should 
maybe perhaps have a theorem that for a family of groups G, we should have this family of Eulerian sequence instead of brute force calculation. So we should get one piece and that is going to lead us to Steenrod operation. And the second thing, let's see, before I end, what else can I see? I had some, uh, some results about the fact that this Euler class will admit a dual. So this, its powers are going to admit a dual. And so for each group G, you're going to have this n roid squaring operation, which behaves very well with the restriction and the, and the, and the geometric uh, fixed points uh, or the maps induced by the restriction and the geometric fixed point functors. And part of this, oops, part of this also appears in a joint work for the case C2 in a joint work with Ang and uh, Ang Lee and Bert Giliu. And I also hope that we can study by defining the corresponding uh, Stifel Whitney classes, uh, you know, some basic problems in equivariant geometry, such as immersions of projective uh, spaces in, 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 in G representations uh, or G equivariant projective spaces in G representations. And, and I hope that all of this work with some more calculations can lead to the understanding of cobordism ring of G equivariant manifolds. That will be a, a cherry on the top. Um, so with this, I'm going to end. <laughs>